going to start with one of our amazing external speakers um, to tell us about the story behind her business, The Entertainer. So, Sonia Weymuller from VentureSouk is here to moderate a conversation with Donna Benton. May I welcome you both? <laughs> Welcome and good morning, everyone. You probably have the two loudest females in the room on stage right now, so good luck. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about Donna Benton's story today. Um, it's a pretty unique one. Who here is not familiar with The Entertainer? Other than The International. <gasps> You must be international. Um, so Donna has a unique story because it's a story that spans over 17 years. Mm -hmm. um, and as I reflected on the evolution of The Entertainer and your story, and I crafted my questions diligently, um, I couldn't help but think about it as a series with characters and seasons. <laughs> and I just downloaded Netflix for the first time this year, so that's maybe why. But um, you've basically evolved into a platform now that's fully digitized in 15 countries across the Middle East, Africa, Europe, and Asia with 300 staff. So let's start with season one, where it all began. Um, Gosh. You moved to Dubai, you identified a gap in the market. How did you decide to address it and why? Um, I, firstly, good morning, everybody. I moved to Dubai when I was 26. I actually came for a job at the time, which fortunately didn't work out. I was coming here for a year, as I think a lot of people do, save money, put a deposit on a house and go back home. But growing up, I've always wanted to have my own company. I always wanted to be independent and I suppose be in control of my own destiny at the end of the day. So I, I worked for the company, then it didn't work out and I thought of the entertainer. And then, you know, I think when you've got so much passion about something, I thought, it's going to work. There wasn't really anything else in the market at that time. It was a simplistic concept. It was buy one, get one free, valid seven days a week. Um, you had to be valid for lunch and dinner, and people had to buy the product. So it had to be a triangle. It had to be a win for the merchant, a win for the customer, and obviously a win as the business. So I'm quite a doer, and I just, I just did it, really. I, I didn't have any money. I came here with $3,000, Australian dollars. I was working in the internet cafe downstairs, doing my feasibility study, uh, which, which I overplanned. And I just put it together and then I just really went out into the market to try and find some funds to, to get it going. And so that's exactly my next question. So the investor <laughs> landscape in 2001 was completely different. This is way before Beko even existed. Um, how did you go about fundraising at that point? Well, to be honest, I was, I was a little naive at that point as well. I, I really didn't even, I knew about private equity, but I didn't really know a lot about it. So all I knew was I just needed to get some funds to start this company, which, by the way, is the hardest thing to do when you're starting up a company. So the biggest thing is some, you have to have a good idea and somebody had to believe in me. So the best people to go to at the beginning are the people that know you. They know your energy, they know your passion, they know your work ethic. So I went around to really my group of friends. Firstly, I went to my uncle. My family um, used to live here. And he was the, the negative one. And he actually said to me, oh, you won't sell more than um, 300 books. And I think at that point, I offered him 50, for 50,000 dirham, 30% of the company. <laughs> so now I'm sending him the press release. <laughs> um, so I, it was actually one of my girlfriends, cutting a long story short. Uh, her name is Neve. She, she believed in me. I worked for her. I worked with her in the job that I came out here for. Her and her husband, he, they both invested. It was 120,000 dirham. Then two years later, they got divorced and I had a boyfriend. We separated, so it was, it was quite a messy exit. <laughs> so, but at the end of the day, they got the 120,000 dirham. I didn't take salary for two years. I probably spent it on all the wrong things, but built and built and built, and that's, where we, um, that's how it started. So talking about exits and not personal ones. So back then, when you started, were you actually thinking already about where you would see the company kind of evolve towards? Did you think, oh, like maybe you'll get bought over one day? Or was it more of a lifestyle choice of like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I just want to run this company. I want to go public. Yeah, no, I, I loved what I did and I wanted to build it up. And I thought one day, gosh, if I could grow this company to sell for a million dirham, I'll be so excited. So that was my goal in the first year, to sell for a million dirham. 
And for me, that was a huge, you know, that was 500,000 Australian dollars that would buy my house. It, it was a huge thing. But then I think when you get going in a business and you love it so much, yes, you have to worry about the money and what's coming in for bills. But because you love it so much, you shouldn't actually worry. The money will come eventually. Your drive, the passion, the work ethic, everything will just come. And that's what I've realised actually along the way. And then as I've grown, it was more, what's the word? It wasn't so much the money, it was more the, the challenge and, and the growth. So from, we did the D Dubai and the UAE, then it was Qatar, then it was Oman. So it was really, it was really the challenge to get into these countries and to be able to prove and to, it was really the growth of the company and to be able to succeed and, and to have something. All right, great. So now we move on to season two, the large investor. Um, in 2012, Viada Enterprise Development, which was uh, Abraja's small and mid-cap investment platform, right. acquired 50% of the company. Yes. Um, what was the catalyst at that point for you deciding to sell such a large stake? Um, yeah, the Abraj, the Abraj acquisition, I used to have uh, quite a lot of... So I'd already had the company, what was it, for 10 years then, and I used to have quite a lot of people come to me if could to invest or could they JV with another business or could they do smart cards so there was a lot of things a lot of things that people came to me for but it just wasn't right uh, that that was my that was my feeling I always go by a lot of my intuition and it just it was either the wrong timing wrong company so when Abraj came it felt right uh, for then. So Abraj were one of the biggest private equity companies. They were in all the countries that we wanted to go to. They were well respected. Um, and it just felt right. I had great synergy with the account managers. Uh, so, you know, they had the same vision. It was a digital vision as well. And they really, my biggest thing was I'm running the company and they really didn't get involved a lot. Obviously, financially and things, they got involved, but operationally, they, they weren't really involved at all. Did any punches, figuratively speaking, of course, because <laughs> I don't condone violence, um, did any punches kind of get thrown in terms of negotiating terms with yes, them? Yes, yes, they what were tough. Were they? Uh, everything. When you, when you negotiate some form of exit, every term comes into play. So it took a year to do the deal from dealing with pretty much everyone in a branch, all their senior account managers to sitting down with Arif to their CEOs. So, you know, it was done. They wanted 51%. Um, there was no way in the world that I was doing that. You know, that took a long time. Then you negotiate on the price. Uh, they negotiated on me as a lock-in. They, you know, they negotiate on a lot. They're putting all this money into, into you, so mm. they want to be secure. But at the end of the day, as I say to all private equity, nothing in life is guaranteed. It's no risk, no reward at the end of the day. But, you know, listen, we were profitable. We're going digital. There wasn't another company really in Dubai like that, mm -hmm. going from a print transaction to a digital so fast, going into 15 countries within three years. Let's not skip that comes at season four. Oh, sorry. So, um, <laughs> So in retrospect, though, um, was there anything you're dealing with uh, a barrage that would be an indicator of things to come? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> no, listen, you know, I'm all about loyalty. And so a barrage were great business partners to me. They, I was literally the only CEO in their portfolio. They, they, I was very direct from the beginning that I'm not going to sit behind and give strategy and business plans for the next five or six years every day. If you want me to run the company, I'm out there, I'm earning money, there's your business plan for three years. You know, we had board meetings, they were there when I needed them, we sent them financials, but otherwise they were great. I think what really helped, our account managers were fantastic. So I got along really, really well, there was a lot of respect, a lot of loyalty, and it's, as I say, it's unfortunate it's what, what's happened, you know, today. But through my journey with Abraj, everything was, everything was good. So at that point, going back to the previous season, when you were thinking about your exit strategy then, how are you now starting to think about the company and it potentially exiting? Yeah, well, look, to be honest, nothing's really changed. For us, our exit was three to five years as any other PE company. And we exited pretty much five years and then the... Um, the cards fell down. So, so yes, yeah, so our plan was pretty much that, but it happened right on the five years. But look, we, they, they were happy to keep us longer, to be honest, and there were decisions that we had to make, why and when and when people come to you, and there's, there's, a, whole lot, there's a whole lot of things why, why you would exit. But you just 
my vision is you want to sell for a certain amount of money. A barrage were always, we need to sell for this, we can sell for X, we can sell for Y. My vision was, that's great, that's your expertise. My expertise is running the company and growing it and taking it to that level. So I was very operational and that's where I was more focused on growing it. Mm. And then we move on to season three. Um, the entertainer goes digital and yes. world domination ensues. <laughs> um, so we're in 2013, you have your pockets full. Um, and that's when you began your digital transformation with the launch of your app. And you, by 2018, you fully shifted from a print play to a 100% data-driven digital one. Correct. Um, Scariest moment of my career, by the way. Exactly. <laughs> going so we're going to get to your lesson. My print books. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then just to add some numbers, 38 destination-specific products, B2B solutions for corporates, 10,000 merchant partners, um, available in English and Arabic and Greek and Cantonese. Mm -hmm. um, this is really like your high growth kind of this is our Period. huge high growth. Right. We, we did literally in three years what another company would do in eight. My, my poor staff, I really, really worked them. They were, they were awesome. It takes a team effort to do it. We have an amazing team. But look, to implement all those countries, digital, CRM platforms, and also at the same time doing the print publication as well because we didn't just swap straight to digital. We had to mould people in because at that time still people didn't have smartphones. Different countries, different like Asia is very digital tech savvy. South Africa a little but not as much. So you really had to look at the different locations. So the first year we roughly converted 13% into digital. Everyone was, oh, let's see, let's see how it goes first. Let's let's get all the mistakes. Let's, you know. So it was roughly 13%, 34, 60, and then this year was 92. So then we just literally all went into a digital platform. Okay, great. Um, and we're gonna move on to season four now, which is the even larger investor and a barrage's exit. Um, 2018, yes. this year, earlier this year, you sold 85% of the company to Bahrain's GFH, I which did. saw Abraj fully exit. Correct. And you remain as chairman, you're still contributing to the vision, the management, the growth of the company alongside GFH. Correct. So why did you decide to sell your own <laughs> shares, about 25%, and why now? Um, you know, I think everyone, I've been doing this for 17 years. I love it. It's my baby. I always, I always put a child company syndrome. So when you are a founder and a startup of a company, it's like, it's like having a child. You know, you're there with it all the time. You love it. You nurture it. You spend money on it. You don't get lots back from it. So that's the, that's the baby analogy. And then as it grows, it becomes into a teenager. And that's when it more becomes an SME where you still have to grow it. You still have to be there. You still love it. But it wants to fly the nest a little bit. And you, you have other people and you have growth and other people come into their lives. And then it gets to be in adolescent, I suppose, in an adult and then they go off and, you know, get married. And I suppose that's where the stage it was at. You know, the company's a full-grown adult now. It's, it's financial. It's got lots of people in there. It, it, need, it always needs you because you're their comfort zone. And it's like, it's like a child as an adult. They always don't think they know, you know what they're doing, but you always do. <laughs> they think because you're not there sometimes. So I use, that, I use that synergy. So, look, for me, at my time of the life, the company has grown. It's a full-pledged adult, you know. And I, in my personal stage, I have, you know, I, I'm a single mom. I got uh, two young children and it's security for me and my kids at the same time. Mm. And it was just the right time, you know, right partner, right amount comes into it, right vision and security for myself at the same time in my family. And so what were you looking for? And I still for? have quite a lot in it at the same time. Yeah. Does the company really need you still? I like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I actually think... As a founder, you're always needed. Um, look at someone like Steve Jobs, for example, or Richard Branson. Anyone can do the job operationally, but no one will ever have your passion. No one will ever have that vision. No, it, people love it like you do, but they, it's in your blood because you started it like a child. So I think operationally, maybe they don't need you, but security, vision, passion mm -hmm. uh, on the board, they, uh, uh, your, um, what's, what's what I'm looking for? Just that spark w within it, they, that's what needs you. Your intuition, that's the word I'm looking for. Intuition to do something. We're quite agile. I'm all about no risk, no reward. You know, some people are on the... So, so you, I think as a founder, you're irreplaceable, but everyone else is replaceable. <laughs> 
Um, hope someone tweeted that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when, when I look at some of our portfolio companies, obviously, like, and all the founders in this room, hopefully, when you guys look out and fundraise and stuff, you're doing DD as well. We're doing DD looking at you guys, looking at your virtual data rooms, et cetera, and kind of doing the nitty gritty stuff. But hopefully all of you, if you are now or in the future fundraising, are also doing DD on us. So in your case, mm -hmm. when, were, when, when you were looking for the investor at this stage, season four, um, what kind of DD did you do? Like, you, know, you ended up with GFH, but you must have looked at other oh, investors listen. as well. Sonia, I, we did as a team a roadshow mm. because it was the project exit. And so I went on an aeroplane for three nights. I went to the States. I had lots of meetings there. I slept on an aeroplane for two nights in a bed one. My eyes were zombie. And the hardest thing when you exit is you feel like a robot because everyone you speak to, you're repeating the same thing. This is what we do. This is how I started. I felt like I just needed to tape it the first time and then just play it. Um, but that, this, that was actually probably one of the hardest things I did because when Abraj came in, we were GCC only. But as we did our exit now, we're global. We're, we've got data, we're digital. There's so many more elements that comes into it. So we did the roadshow in the States and, and also here, which was a fantastic, fantastic experience. The people like the Carlyle Group, Groupon, there was, there was lots of different companies. And then it was GFH um, who came to us from Bahrain. And they were the last ones, and I just remember sitting in my boardroom thinking, oh, God, here I go again. Are these people serious? Are they not? And literally, I gave them the highest level, and they, they got it, which, which was great. And then we started with the, you know, the NDAs and the LOIs, and, and that's pretty much how it happened. And that was roughly a eight-month negotiation. There was a lot of testosterone involved. <laughs> I was dealing with roughly 18 men, whether they're private equity or lawyers or accountants. So it was a much, much harder transition transaction. And it was right at the very end as an intel. It was probably the last three weeks where the deals, you know, you're about to sign, it gets tough, then they want some further information. You're doing your due diligence back. Why do I want them? What other companies do they own? You know, this whole process where the sparks fly, you're on conference calls, everyone's trying to talk over each other. And I mean, I felt like I was a school teacher. You know, guys, shh, shh, you know. So it was, it was a great experience, but it, it was tough. It, I'm not going to say it was easy and it was flowing. The Abraj acquisition was much more cruisier. The GFH was a lot more um, detailed. That's exactly what I want to talk about right now, is when you're looking at a, like, kind of your Abraj experience and your GFH experience, are they, are they intrinsically kind of different investors? Did one have more legal strength, for example, compared to the others in terms of rights? And then even behaviorally, did they act differently as, as investors? Or do they act with GFH? Uh, look, looking back, they were totally different. And I think every private equity company is different. So they have their strengths, the development areas, they outsource certain things, they have in-house certain things. So a Abraj were, ooh, how do I? Uh, <laughs> they, diplomatic. They were, they're more of an all-rounder. You know, obviously every company has to bring their due diligence into a point, whether it be their lawyers or accountants. But they, they were probably in-house a little bit more law savvy mm -hmm. and a bit more future, um, not blue skies, but um, visionary with, with the amount. GFH, again, that they bought legal in, in, in uh, not, they outsourced it, but they were very, very savvy accountancy wise, extremely savvy. So figures, they were onto everything. So they were both very, very different. But GFH, were, their due diligence was, was, was tough, you know. It was, it was really tough from, from every single figure, from basically every single cent spent for, forever that you have to go through the process. Mm. So the legal side, you have your lawyers and you, and you deal with that. It, it's actually the figures. The vision is fine if you're both on the same page, but it all comes down to the amount, what's to be paid, the terms and conditions, and revenue recognition. There was, there was a whole lot involved in it, but they were very savvy with the accounts. Okay. Um, I think if I was a guy, I would have been bald by now. <laughs> <laughs> or you'd have short hair. With the like amount me. of stress, yes. Um, <laughs> all right, so now we move on to season five. All right, so sneak peek, again with my Netflix analogy, of what's next. Um, 
what's in store now for you for the entertainer? But I also want to move on afterwards and talk about you as as Donna. Okay. But so what's in store now for the entertainer? Are you going to acquire anything? Yeah, Do the entertainer. Anything? We, <laughs> <laughs> a secret undercover. <laughs> uh, no, we look. It's really it's a really exciting stage for the entertainer. You know, we have new shareholders. We have you know my vision, but their vision as well. So it's a bit of new blood, new oomph also. So where the great thing is, we're always hiring people. We're looking at some acquisitions in other countries. We look at we're going deeper, we're going wider. You know, data is really important to us. So we we are. It's exciting. We we are going places. We are looking at some huge um, acquisitions at the same time, and it's onwards and upwards. Okay, and then. But keeping it simple. I'm all about simple at the same time. It's all about value. If you overcomplicate things, then it just gets messy and doesn't work at the same time as well. Mm. And then also, I mean, what's be- the beauty of, of, of Donna is also the fact that you're also kind of giving back um, in the sense that, you know, you're successful, mashallah. Um, you. But you're also personally investing in other areas, aside from the entertainer, which is her entertainer hat, but she also has the Donna hat, which is, you know, separate. (laughs) Um, So, you know, you co-own a fitness company, you're involved in multiple restaurants um, in the UAE, you opened a salon, so this is kind of you giving back almost uh, to, to the SME sector. Yeah, so for me, um, I grew along the way with entertainer. I always tell, I get, not financial advice, but... I love to spend, don't get me wrong, but I'm all about you You spend when you save. You don't spend first because then you can't save. So, mm. so you grow that. So along the way with the entertainer, whether it be a dividend or salaries, I've always invested in property. So I always think you can't go broke in property, you've always got somewhere to live. So I've invested, I think, wisely in property along the way in Australia, Vietnam, Thailand, and the UAE. So I have a diverse portfolio. But also, you know, the entertainer is my baby, but I also have other challenges and I have other things I want to do as well. But you have to do things that you believe, well, for me anyway, I have to do something I love and then I believe in that I'm passionate about. So I, I love sport, I love fitness, so I invested in a sports company where we provide all the sporting goods for all the schools and all the clubs and we do their apparel. So that's called Dawson Sports where, where we do that. Then I have a hair salon, a beauty salon, and I did the beauty salon really because all the years of the entertainer we had a beauty product and everything opened at nine or 10 and there was nothing which used to frustrate me for working women to go to like at 7.30 or to take your kids to. So I actually opened the salon more for the working women to be able to go and do their, I don't know, blow dries or whatnot, somewhere to be able to take their kids, for the school mums to drop to drop their kids and to be able to get a hair colour. This is probably really boring for you guys. But 90% <laughs> of the men in the audience. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. But think of yourself as a woman. It's really boring. So um, so anyway, so the hair salon, so do that. So long working hours, really good service, not that expensive, and it's churn. So that was the hair salon and then I invested in uh, in restaurants here because I've dealt with them for 17 years so we have a really good portfolio of I don't know if your kids have taken your kids to Black Tap does anyone know Black Tap you must know Black Tap mm-hmm. so uh, Black Tap I invested in uh, the beach club at, at Rixos Premium at JBR so we have the whole beach club out there with two restaurants Luigi and we're opening some more along the way so i The things that I'm passionate, I thought about this the other day, actually, because what do I want to do? Mm -hmm. You know, that's your biggest struggle. What's your next challenge? What do you want to do? And it's what you love. So for me, I love health. I love fitness. I love helping people, property and food. So they're the things that I need to get involved in. If somebody came up to me and said, I really want you to invest in spare parts, it makes a 15% return per year, I probably wouldn't because I'm not interested in it at all. So it would have to be something that I'm interested in. What about tech startups? You have a bunch of them here. I think. Yeah, no, I have a tech company. So I'm, I'm all about tech startups. I've just invested in a virtual reality company and, and some other things probably that I can't say at the moment. But but yeah, I'm, I'm all about that. But I have to, with the tech startup again, I have to like what the tech startup is, is about and what they're doing. Okay, great. Um, I want to keep, because I mean, we talked a little bit and about very different topics, but I really, this is about you guys today, because this is the Founders Forum, so I also mm. want to open it up to the floor. I think there's some mics somewhere. Um, this is really your opportunity to ask Donna any questions that you guys have. I know some of you in the audience, and you're all at different kind of, you know, phases in your, or seasons in your trajectories, so if you have any 
quite direct questions to ask Donna. This is really the, the, the time. She's extremely hard to get a hold of. This is the first time I met her today. <laughs> I had to do it with her PR team before this. So, <laughs> so really take advantage of the fact that she's on stage and you can talk to her directly. <laughs> Don't feel shy. Sorry, oh, you can ask one, me anything. It's there's okay. Danny in the back who wants to ask a question. <laughs> Hi, thanks a lot for speaking to us today. Can you talk a little Please bit about me. your defensibility? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, you came up with an idea, buy one, get one free, and there's a lot of players in the market today. Mm -hmm. Everyone's trying to do something in, um, in the space. Can you mm -hmm. tell us a bit about how you were able to stay ahead of everyone and de defended kind of your turf Defend your right. with, the, with all the years there. <laughs> sure. Thank you. So when I started The Entertainer 2001, we were pretty much the only player. It was at an embryonic stage. The only thing really was Diners Club with the 10% off. You saw a gap in the market. So, you know, then the daily deal sites came. I had Golf News try and do a book the same as us. So for me, what I have always done with competitors, I've watched them, but I haven't put my whole soul into them. Because as soon as you put all your energy into something else, you're not focusing on your company. So relation, one with the entertainer, relationship building is extremely important in any business that you have. So with all of our merchants, merchants are the foundation of our company, that we were exclusive, they couldn't go in any other publications. If they did, I would kick them out. So I was very tough with that. So when I found out all these other players were coming, again, I went to my merchants. I uh, account manage them. We were giving, I never made them forget what we also give them and what a startup would give them, which was not a lot at that point because they had to grow the company. So you really have to be in their face and you actually have to let them know that you're the leader. Um, to, to stay number one, you have to work like you're number two. That's another thing. Never get in our world cocky and think that you're, you're the best and things will evolve. So you always, you always have to work hard. You always have to be agile. You have to be prepared to move quickly. Uh, you know, a lot of people, oh, let's do a feasibility on this. By the time you've done a six-month feasibility, mm -hmm. three people have already passed you. As an entrepreneur and founders, you've got to move quickly. You've got to go with your gut feeling sometimes, and it's risk. As I say, no risk, no reward. So that's really important as well. And look, as I say, focus on your competition. Don't let it absorb you. Stick to your foundation. Think of the entertainer as the two-for-one model. And then we had all the daily deal sites. They were great. You know, those Groupon, Living Social, Kaboom. There was, there was loads of them. Everyone was like, oh, Donna, you need to do this. We need to compete with them. I'm like, absolutely not. We're a different model. This is our platform. They're, they're, we couldn't be any different. But don't ever get scared. You have to believe in yourself and what you do and don't worry. Good luck to them. You know, it's great, their business. Hope they earn like millions. But you know what? At the end of the day, I was focused on my company, my staff, and my culture, and that's what grew the business. And then look where they all are today. <laughs> sorry. You really cheeky. just have to believe in... Yeah, sorry. You just have to really believe in yourself. Don't get defensive. You just have to be work, just work, work, work. Stay on track. And my biggest thing is always remember your foundation and your core values within your company and what it is. Hope that helped. Don't be intimidated. Hi, Hi hello. <laughs> Hope that helped. Hi, hello. Hello. Um, Donna, you talked about testosterone being in the room just now. Um, yeah. If you were starting today as a founder, um, how, do you, do you, how do you perceive that it's fairly equal if you were a female founder as opposed to being a male founder locally? Or do you do think that you still have to negotiate the testosterone? No, no, no. I've always said there was just a lot in my deal. Um, but when you found a company and you start up a company, I'm all about equality at the same time. So one of the questions I always get generally in interviews is, was being a woman harder for you? Mm, in that's a, why I didn't ask you that country? question. <laughs> I always get that. And I always answer, no, absolutely not. It was fantastic because we had girls queues in banks, you're in the economic department quicker. And to be honest, it was actually easier being a girl than it was being a guy. And that's not a sex thing going in and flirting or whatnot. It was actually about equality, whereby there was every opportunity, there's every opportunity here for a woman to do exactly what a man does. So I'm on the man side when some, and I'm all about girl power, don't get me wrong. But if a woman says, oh, I can't really do this because I'm a woman in this country, I'm like, absolutely wrong. You, you can absolutely do it. If anything, it's actually on your side to do it because there's actually more opportunity here for women mm -hmm. than there are in any other countries. Um, I'm going to jump in. <laughs> Donna, wow. So enjoyed your... Uh, 
your authentic discussion. Thank so you. So there are very few examples of companies that have succeeded the transformation, digital, digital transformation, particularly in the content space. NASPERS, uh, Financial Times are two that come to mind. When you, in the early days, were making the digital transformation, which is still quite early, we were seeing a gazillion, you know, entertainer wannabes, uh, in addition to all the Daily Deal guys, which I personally was involved in as, as well at some stage. <laughs> and it was interesting because I personally was actually quite skeptical that you were, not you, but the entertainer would be able to make that um, as successfully as you have that transition. Can you talk a little bit um, a little bit in depth about how you actually did that because you know you clearly fought off a ton of competition um, and sort of rose to higher heights. Yeah, so I a lot of it is what I was just saying is you have to stick to your foundation. So with the entertainer, we're a buy one get one free model, and the key thing with us it was our merchants. So whether that be buy one get one free or a discount offering or whatever it may be. <laughs> It was our core, our, core val our core product, which was the book at that point. It was the book and it was the buy one, get one free. So it's pretty simple. You know, you've got terms and conditions, you've got buy one, get one free, you've got a book. It's not simple to do, but it's simple when people use it for the merchants. So when we became, when there was everyone that came digital, it was very different from us. And I, and I knew that. I didn't want to go around those terms and conditions, even with collecting money, you know, the merchant gets all of the money. With the daily deal sites, the daily deal sites gets the money. We had longevity of a 12 month period, that might be 30 days for them. So we were very, very different. So with the book to the digital transition, it was pretty much the book going into a phone. <laughs> it, not as easy again as that. But that, that, was, that was the vision, because I'm, I'm not a technical person, by the way. When my team did the app, where everything we did pretty much in-house, I said, and no offense if someone is, I'm like, I know you guys are great at what you did, but I'm like, I don't want you to make it for the technical geeks. I said, you need to make it for me. Mm -hmm. I need you to make it for the school mums, the normal people. What do I do this? What's this called? You know, that's, what, that's who you need to make it for. And, and literally, that's the journey with the wireframes that we went on. If, if I didn't understand it, it got cut. Or if someone else in the company, a general person, didn't understand, it wasn't our eBiz team because they all got it. If they got it, I wasn't interested. It was other people. I showed my friends, do you understand this? Can you do this? Can you log into this? Oh, that's a bit complicated. Yeah, okay, right. So that was what it was. But we always had our foundation, which was the offer. It was the value, it was the offer, it was the two for one. Because anyone could have the best app in the world, but you've got to use it. Mm -hmm. So that was my intel, not to, oh, we've got this function and gamification and it's so exciting and like, that's great, but you gotta get the ball rolling and people have gotta get on there. Did you hire separate teams for product and distribution? When we, when we first started, we hired a, an, a, from a UK company to help us, but after one year, everything came in house. It was everything, we have an office in Pakistan, in Lahore, we have 75 guys there that do programming. We have another 35 in our office here. We have digital data teams. I mean, I've never breathed digital so much, to be honest, and I'm still learning every day. But again, I rely on my team, but it's the foundation, it's the simplicity that keeps keeps the churns going over. It's the little things. The press release has got to be right. You know, that's what a company is. You might, Sonia might use the app, it's customer service. You know, it's not about, oh, this function, which is awesome, but it's also about, oh, I know how much Sonia's saved on the app. Let's give her a call because she's the biggest spender this year and let's give her a free product for next year. You know, so that's what it's about. It, it's about customer service. It's about knowing your company inside. It's all about the detail. And that's what people forget sometimes. Anyone else? Over here. Hi. Oh, oh you're go. all right. Over there. Oh, hello. Hey, Donna. <laughs> uh, so just on the first point, it was quite interesting you touched on the fact that you didn't really look too much at your competition. And there's a nice saying that startups actually, they die of suicide, not homicide. Okay. You know, competition <laughs> doesn't usually like, it's usually internal issues which might cause a startup to implode. Could you maybe share how you dealt with any internal issues that you faced? Oh gosh, I've had lots of internal mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. God, I could get the flip chart. Um, you have to be strong, um, I think internally, <laughs> you have, whether it be, st you mean staff issues, correct? Uh, so staff issues, they come to you, your team, they think sometimes they can be you, they're better, they try to start up their own thing, they try, I've had, 
uh, when I was starting up Entertainer, I had one girl that she was trying to poach all the merchants for another company that she'd started at the same time. I fired her. She tried to take me to court. Then another one went single white female. Then, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've literally had, like, everything you could possibly... I've, I mean, I've had lots of stuff for a long, long time, but you'll always get a little bit of the jealousy involved, that people can do it better than you, uh, laziness I don't tolerate. I'm, but what you need to do in a company, I believe in giving chances, but not that big a chance. If they mess up, they're out. Because I, don't, I have a saying in work, if somebody leaves to go somewhere and they want to come back, I don't reheat cold coffee. And everybody knows in my company that once they go they don't come back, unless it's pregnancy or they're leaving to go to another <laughs> country or something along those lines. But I'm all about company culture as well. You have to employ that. You know, one girl, she was coming for a job interview. She was honest with me. She told me she was eight months pregnant. She was a receptionist. And I actually said, because you've told me that, you've got the job. You know, so there's things you have to build up for company culture. I put a hair salon in our office. I wanted everyone to feel good and look good when they, when they go out. And that's for men as well. So, look, you always get the people that um, will try and do wrong in a way, but they've got to go. It's, it's, I know it sounds awful, but it's like a cancer and you have to get rid of them. And you have to get the people in your office that respect you to start off with, that are on the same page as you, that want to go with you. And there's always going to be people in the office that are there for the first day of the month for the salary. They're the soldiers. But there's also people that you want for the journey. And you have to incentivize your management. At the end of the day, you know, we do, we do some ESOPs, we do that, an incentive share option plans. So you have to reward your staff. We give bonuses every year. We give appraisals every year. You know, we give Christmas parties every year. You know, we really look after our staff. So I think you just have to, if you have a problem with the staff and you don't feel comfortable, out. That should come work for you. Yeah. Um, They've got to work for you. <laughs> I want to come work for you now. Yeah, you can work for me. <laughs> um, all right. Any last questions? You have 15 seconds. Okay. Uh, hi, Donna. Thanks oh, for sharing. Uh, your... Where am I? Okay, two more questions. because I can't see the... Oh, sorry. So thanks for sharing uh, your story with us. Uh, Pleasure. Um, would you like to share something about the the market landscape at the time when you launched 17 years ago and because it's very much said that the time to market and the right market is really important for any business to start up mm. uh, at that time how was it and uh, how did you uh, work on the valuation side when you had no other competitors or who were your competitors at that time compared to now thank you Okay, gosh, I could probably speak for half an hour on this, but I... Um, Please don't, because we don't have much Yeah, time. no, no, I've got flashing <laughs> red. Um, so with um, the... Uh, hang on, where am I going to start with this? I st Sorry, what was the first part of your question? Competitive oh, landscape back when you were Oh, yeah, open. available landscape. There, it was very at the embryonic stages. There was a diner's club. I had an idea. I went with it. To be honest, I loved it so much, I wouldn't have cared if there was another five people doing it, because you've got to believe in your work ethic and your vision. But what did come as a hurdle, I was launching, September 11 came, I put everything into it, and then I was like, wow, I've put everything into this, and now there's a whole thing about the Middle East, and we've had September 11. So you either think of it as a positive, well, obviously not a positive, but you need to, you need to not soul can be at home and, ooh, I've lost everything. You have to be like, right, I'm still moving forward, this is a great company, it's a great prospect, people still live here, they can use it. So you have to still move with what you believe in. It was harder, but you had to move with it. You have your challenges along the way launching something. So people thought it was too good to be true with the entertainer. I didn't shrink wrap books to start off with. People stole the vouchers in Spinny, so I knew what all the good ones were. So there was lots of mistakes that I made along the way. Um, but with regards to the valuation, to be honest, no idea had I had. I've never done this before. I was just operationally, I was growing a company. When I got the investment for 30%, $120,000, anyone could have probably said, I just needed that money, you know. So for then, but when Abraj came in, then, you know, I'd been in it for 10 years. So I, I knew a lot more at that point. So that's when I got lawyers and things along the way. But what I did do, I think, as a founder, what's really important every single year, if I could give some advice, um, you have to audit. I audited from day one. So I know when I go into a company sometimes, if they're three years in, oh, I have never audited. 
they just sort of run with their own books. Auditing is really, really important because that's what people buy you on, not a, not a A4 bit of paper that you can work out some figures. So auditing is really important from day one. It will cost you a little bit, but that's also important. If you have a product, trademark is also really important. I know people, it's expensive in some areas. You don't have to trademark the world, but if you have a product or something that you're doing in this region at least, trademark it. You know, Europe, there's one, you can, the EU, there's one trademark for the whole of the EU, so you can do it. So look at the different classes that you need to be in, and that also is a really, really important. So that also keeps competitors out coming into that class as well using your name. All right, we have one last question from Arij, and then she has to exit Sorry. <laughs> the stage. <laughs> First call, uh, thank you, ladies, for, uh, for this uh, great opening uh, panel. I had a question for you, Donna, and I mean, I'm not a founder, but um, one thing that I think generally we face when we meet some of the startups is in terms of their vision of, you know, what the, their milestones that they want to reach. So you started about 17 years ago, so obviously the landscape was a little bit different in the region. Um, but in terms of, you know, looking globally, so, you know, you've, you're in so many different countries now, how did you, you know, was that an initial vision for you or did that come along and what would your advice be to the founders today in respect to you know the markets that they tend to build their products for sure i think uh good question i think when you start up a company you can't think global because it's impossible you have to do it's like running a marathon think of it you're not thinking where you start you're not thinking i've already completed the 42k because you haven't, it takes a long way to get there and to train. So think of it as 10 kilometers at a time. And it's exactly the same in a business. So when I started The Entertainer, started with UAE, and then we were successful, oh, actually, I think I could crack the GCC here. You know, I'm going to aim for Bahrain and Oman and um, Saudi, and that, that was my vision. And then those obstacles, they're achievable. So then when you, that's a big achievement to actually crack as such the, the GCC. So then you do that and then you achieve that and then you think, right, now where else can I come? It'll organically grow. Then you, you'll get on more of a high. Right, what other region do we want to, do we want Asia? I mean, you could pick anywhere in the world, where, depending on your product, but it's then that next 10 kilometers you want to go. So we could do Asia then. So let's focus on Asia, but maybe at the same time, Cape Town could be a good offering, but we won't go into all of South Africa. Let's just do Cape Town. So you have to really, you, you can't do everything at once. You have to really focus on what you want to do first and then you move the next step, then the next step. Because if you do everything in one hit, you're not going to do it well. And that's what I always said with Entertainer Growing. Let's get UAE first, baby steps into the next country. I grew one country at a time. And listen, I know people want to do everything in three years, but to build a successful company in 17 years is actually quite a short frame, a short time window. So you're not going to build a successful company in two years' time. Even look at Facebook, all these companies. It was years beforehand, but when you become successful, everyone thinks it just happened overnight, but it doesn't. So again, it's, it's pieces. Yeah, that's me anyway, it's journeys. Take 10K in each block, and then you'll succeed globally to the marathon. Super. Thank you very much, Donna Benton. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Thank you, Sonia. <laughs>